ETFs. That was very much a part of yesterday's moves. They were created with the little guy in mind, but yesterday's chaos reminds us that they are not immune to it either. Matt Nesto has been taking a closer look at that. Hi, Matt. Hi, Sue. So yeah, and especially with that list of canceled trades being so dominated by the ETFs. If you take a look at the aftermath uh, of the ETFs, you have to remember a couple of things. This is a product sector, folks, that grew about 50% in terms of assets last year. Giant uh, uh, assets there. There's about 1,000 ETFs uh, in existence. And uh, as you're seeing, about 75% of the canceled trades, those that were out Outside the plus or minus 60% in that 20 minute window, uh, those were all ETFs, or I should call them ETPs, which is exchange traded products. There's all kinds of different acronyms out there, but for the most part, they're ETFs, and for the most part, they're all they're plain vanilla long funds, probably three quarters of them, but there are uh, a lot of them uh, that have these long and short components, uh, leverage, if you will, and double and triple shorts. Uh, but about one third of the trading volume uh, right now comes from. Uh, ETFs and the uh, growth of those leveraged products uh, is uh, growing uh, not only with individuals but also with institutions and in some cases with institutions that want to circumvent prospectus restrictions that would prohibit them from owning the uh, actual derivatives in those uh, short uh, and, and, and long or double long leveraged funds. So uh, let me just give you one example uh, of a fund. Look at this two-day chart uh, from PowerShares, their um, OTC. Uh, you can see the stock drop. It looks like zero on there, but it actually uh, shows about one trade going through uh, during that window yesterday at 15 cents a share. I looked at it, something in the neighborhood of 3,500 shares traded here. Not a big trade, not a big situation, and then flat right back to where it was uh, before. Uh, if you take a look at where we go from here, I spoke to a number of the ETF uh, issuers. Uh, they are aware of the issue. They are talking to the exchanges. Uh, they want the exchanges to provide a reliable marketplace. Uh, for their product. They say that day uh, and that moment was just a reminder of the turmoil and the tension in the marketplace. And Simon, they also point out that their products work and they continue to meet client needs. Back to you. Thank you very much, Matt Nesto. So are ETFs a sort of trading weapon of mass destruction, if you like? Here to help us sort out ETFs is Paul Justice, ETF strategist at Morningstar. Paul, does it shock you to find when you get that snapshot, as we did, of a moment, a very important moment in market history, that 75% of the trades that have to be cancelled are ETFs, or is it symptomatic of the fact that the, uh, the, the, the high-frequency players use them so prominently? Yeah, you know, the, the high frequency brings a problem into the equation. You have to remember, ETFs are used by two separate sets, investors and traders. The traders were the ones who were burned here. And don't, uh, you know, don't shoot the messenger. Those who are using these investment tools, accessing the low cost and tax efficiencies of ETFs, and didn't trade during that time frame, have seen great benefits from ETFs over the past couple of years. And it, they weren't impacted by yesterday's turmoil. The underlying markets got broken, so some of the ETFs had, you know, a few trades go through. Like you said, no volume behind them. But uh, there, there were some adverse experiences that the markets are addressing. But I think they were affected by it, Paul, if they're sitting mm -hmm. at home and watching, watching the kind of volatility in those particular issues that we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. Is the problem that not all ETFs, ETFs are created equal? I mean, you have some people who may be in leveraged ETFs or commodity ETFs, not aware of the risks and mm -hmm. not aware of the fact that, as Matt Nesto so aptly put it, those very vehicles are being used by some of the bigger guys on the street to get around restrictions where they would not otherwise be able to play. No, I think there's definitely some problems within the leverage space and in the commodity space. But those funds are largely made up of derivative contracts. You know, the ETFs that, like the spider that old 500 underlying stocks that perform mm -hmm. pretty darn well and are more appropriate for the people who are sitting at home. If you don't understand the derivatives markets and the risks that come with leveraged ETFs or even commodity ETFs, you should not be in those. Now, should investors educate themselves more before jumping in there? Yes, they should. And is there potential that uh, regulators should look in and make sure there's more oversight to make sure the right people are using those products? those products? I think so. I know you have to sign off on a disclosure if you want to buy options contracts on an exchange, and perhaps if you're using an ETF to get uh, levered derivative exposure, maybe you should have to is, sign off on the same kind of agreement. Is the, is the exchange mechanism the right marketplace for ETFs, or do they need a different type of marketplace? I think it is the appropriate mechanism. There's other steps that can be taken to make sure you protect investors from you know, some unanticipated risks. Like I said, if you really understand leveraged ETFs and you're the high-frequency trader, you're part of that very small portion of the population, 
um, you know, you, you, it's not going to be a, a big impediment to you to sign a piece of paper that says you understand okay. the risks. Thank you. Appreciate My pleasure. it, Paul.